There is something so mysterious, so sexy, so celebratory, so difficult to put our fingers on exactly what this mystical beverage, champagne, represents. And maybe it has to do with the trajectory of it all and the games that were played and the controversy over the champagne industry, which still translates into each bottle and sip. Uh, From the design of the coupes after perhaps Marie Antoinette's breasts, to trying to find some documentation, some facts, some truths to the life of a young Barbie Nicole Clicquot Ponsardin. Her life is as mysterious as the champagne industry was and still is. This woman, Barbie Nicole Clicquot Ponsardin, Madame Veuve, the Grand Dame, her life and the importance of each and every decision she made over 200 years ago, the woman who changed the landscape of the industry forever. Her spirit and face are on and in every bottle that we so lovingly pop that cork and sip as luxury laps over our souls. And what a story. The historical conditions that paved the way, the challenges she overcame as a woman who built from nothing to the luxury brand Veuve Clicquot, her contributions to wine tourism, riddling, women in the industry. It's just remarkable. So settle in because we are about to journey with Dr. Tilar Matzeo, author of The Widow Clicquot, the story of a champagne empire and the woman who ruled it. So welcome everyone to the Just Forking Around podcast. And this is a bonus episode to celebrate International Champagne Day, October 19th, 2018. And I could not be more excited to share with you all this episode with Dr. T.R. Matzeo. Now, she is the New York Times, LA Times, and San Francisco Chronicle bestselling author of books that include The Widow Clicquot, The Secret of Chanel No. 5, Hotel on the Place Vendôme, and Irina's Children. She also writes on food and wine for the mainstream press, and her work has appeared in venues such as food and wine, and in her Back Lane Wineries guidebook series, which is such an amazing series. Back Lane Wineries of New York State, Back Lane Wineries of Napa, and Back Lane Wineries of Sonoma. I highly recommend, so definitely get your hands on those. And her latest book, Eliza Hamilton, The Extraordinary Life and Times of the Wife of Alexander Hamilton, has just been released. She has a course on creative nonfiction called Great Courses. It's widely distributed and it has made her a nationally prominent teacher of writing and nonfiction genres. The Clara C. Piper Associate Professor of English at Colby College, she divides her time amongst coastal Maine, New York City, and British Columbia, where she lives currently. She also received her winemaking certificate from UC Davis. And now this is so awesome. She and her husband are the proprietors of Parcel Vineyard, which is up in Sanicton, BC, where she makes natural wines and the vineyard is biodynamic, which as you all know, is right up my alley and her wines are now available. So if you get the chance to visit that area of BC, which is near Victoria, definitely map a visit to Parcel Vineyard. So in this episode, we met at the Hyatt Regency in Orange County, and she was in between her whirlwind book tour. Um, we were seated in the lobby of that hotel. So there are there is some background noise, some ambient noise. That's why you may hear some, some different sounds, light sounds. They're not going to um, ruin anything. I uh, just wanted to give you a little heads up on that. But this is the best part. Okay, ready? So right in the middle of the recording, you know, we have the gear out. I also filmed this. It's also going to be on Facebook. We have the full headsets and microphones. And out of nowhere, we're interrupted by the food and beverage manager right in the middle because I had brought a bottle of Veuve Clicquot, of course, to kick off with the toast, enjoy drinking during the recording. And apparently he found the need to interrupt in the middle to tell me that I need to pay a corkage fee, which, okay, I get that. But in the middle of the episode, you'll find that part. And I promised Dr. TR to keep that moment in the recording. So we did not at 
edit that out. And it really has a funny and actually appropriate underlining meaning, it seems, <laughs> for we just at that moment uh, were speaking about Moet and the, his frustration back then with Vuv, not knowing how the madam was able to expedite and fill all those sh- champagne orders. And that was because she had discovered riddling, but which was not revealed yet to the other champagne houses. Uh, so if that doesn't make sense to you in this moment, it will when you hear that section of the episode. So awesome. So settle in, everybody. And without further ado, please enjoy this episode with Dr. Tilar Matseo and the spirit of Madame Vuv. Okay, so Dr. Tilar Matseo, welcome. Thank you. How are you? I'm so excited. Yeah, great. (laughs) Uh, You are the author of many books, but for this episode, we are going to just focus on The Widow Clicquot, the story of a champagne empire and the woman who ruled it. Yes. Yes. But first, we have to start off with the toast. (laughs) Always. (laughs) Always. And I know, you know, I love, first of all, we must look, this is a love, very much loved book. I, I, I spent a lot of um, time. We like to see. There's a quiz okay. later. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't be like, don't disrespect no. the book. But I think that that's what's so great about books. Yeah. So in the back of the book, in the PS section, there is a part about the proper way to open a bottle of champagne. Yes. <laughs> and so, of course, in honor mm-hmm. of the special occasion with you and talking about Madame Vuv, we had to. We absolutely we had to. to. Just... Okay, I'll get the coffee with the lipstick out of the way, <laughs> shall I? Okay. More elegant. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Okay, so let's do this. Do you want to okay. start? You want to uh, yeah. do the honors of opening okay. it? We're going to do the whole process. And I know so that... you read the book in the book about the Frenchman who told me how to open it? Tell us. It's a little bit risque. <laughs> so, what I was once told by a Frenchman, who I think might have possibly been hitting on me, was that, was that the way that you're supposed to open it is so that it doesn't make a pop because that's indecorous, but that you're supposed to open it so that it sounds like a girl sighing with pleasure. Mm, so we'll okay. see whether I can do that. It never quite sounds like that, but I'm anyhow, so the thing I did learn from, from this French gentleman was also a little kitchen safety, which is if you keep your fingers over this, mm. like this, you open it just like that, Put your fingers here. It can't okay. escape oh, from Oh, that's right. And then... And then we turn from oh, the bottom. Yes. Let's see. Does it sound like a happy lady? No, a it doesn't. Bit. A little oh, bit. Very, so, very, very, okay, <laughs> happy a little lady. bit. But it didn't spray all over no. us everywhere or go on the ceiling. Which and nobody died sight. in the opening of it. So I think I we're it. good. <laughs> I love it. Great. Yeah, and then I you pour? have a way of pouring too, I believe, in the back of the book. You yes. talk about that. Yes. They talk about doing it and then turning it which I thought was handy and not like getting over eager in the beginning and having to come back around. All right, I raise my glass. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. Yeah. And what are we going to cheers to? I think we should cheer to women who make really good wine. Absolutely. <laughs> cheers. Chin, chin. Chin, chin. I'm take a sip. Mm. Mm. Let's just call it a day there, shall we? Absolutely. Take right our there. feet, take the that shoes off. Good. <laughs> I love it. Put the sweatpants on. <laughs> Hell again. <laughs> I love it. I have to take one more sip because... Mm. Mm. It's so delicious. Okay, so mm. when, let's talk a little bit about... It's so interesting, Dr. Tuar, because reading this book, it was the story of love, but there was also seemed to be this parallel of, of you seeking this information and the mystery and the intrigue yes. and the controversy. <sighs> and I, so it's going to be... It's, I feel like we need to go back and forth when we talk a little bit about love, but also your experience on yeah. what you, how you found some of that information. Yeah. So... I'm just going to pull out some of the things because for us to understand Vuv's life, because it's like this, I just can feel it and smell it and taste it and see it. And when I wonder when you drink this, are you, you must feel her, know her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm deeply familiar with this champagne by now (laughs) (laughs) and with her story. So in the beginning, let's see, we talk a little bit, let's talk about Vuv, Madam Mm -hmm. Vuv, when she was, she's young, she's growing up Mm -hmm. and uh, she's uh, the daughter of, um, you know, a, a, an affluent textile industrialist, you know, yeah. men. And she's like 12 or 13, right? Mm-hmm. And she has a trajectory of her life. Yeah. Female, you know, born 1777. So we know where she's going to be headed. Right. Which is, And she does even end up there in the beginning, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, her, her, what she is raised for is to be really great in social chit-chat and to do fancy embroidery and dance well. 
and ultimately to be the society, society. wife of a wealthy man. And then there was a small situation that happened, the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Messes up some plans so, in a so, good way. <laughs> and so that kind of shifts. Tell us a little bit yeah. about that. That, that was a huge t- turning point. Yeah, because her dad, right, early on, her dad, her dad is kind of enamored with the aristocracy early on. And then later on, too. But, um, but in the period of the French Revolution, you know, which is this period where in France, they decided that the divine right of kings was just a little bit OTT, right? <laughs> that we maybe needed to have a little bit more um, justice in, in the social, in social class. Um, the French Revolution began, and that was, of course, ended with the execution of Marie Antoinette and the king. Mm-hmm. And her father at that point is a very, very smart guy. And he decides to throw in his lot with the people and not with the kings. And so becomes very, very involved in that moment. And he, was, and he switches the whole, the whole landscape of who he was and, and actually saved the life yes. of his family. Yes, absolutely. And at that point, also, one of the interesting things was that, of course, at that point, being openly religious was oh, yeah. also not something that you did. So that was one of the reasons why, although the family did remain religious— Ultimately, her early life events happen in cellars underneath the family home. Which is interesting. I thought that was great. It's so great. And then the, there's another important piece, too, about this. When she then gets marries, it's an arranged yes. marriage, but they happen to like each other, her and Francois. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Francois. And where do they get married? So they get married <laughs> in the cellar. So the thing that's so amazing, if you ever have a chance to visit Reims or Epernay, but Reims in particular in the Champagne, the, the central town in the Champagne, is that underneath the city for hundreds of miles are these chalk caves, the Crayer, that have all been tunneled out. And they were tunneled out as early as the Romans. But of course, when the champagne industry then begins, thanks to Madame Clicquot and some of the other, um, some of the other people in this story, they're ready and available for these amazing cellars for winemaking. Wow. But they connected houses to each other. And so when she, as you said, she gets married in this arranged marriage to somebody, she's, she, there's just, it's a, it's a family empire that they're consolidating in textile. Right. And um, at that point, when they get married, they get married in the champagne cellars, which of course is ultimately a sign that it must have all been destiny. <laughs> it is. And then, because isn't that one of the, the, one of the locations where perhaps she discovered or came about with her, the riddling and which we'll get to, or else maybe making her first bottle is that the same area exactly they would have been those same caves that she that she invents riddling in see yeah. that to me just is just so it's such a story that is hard to grasp in a sense because it's yeah. when you see the timeline the trajectory it makes sense when you connect the dots but then at that time I mean, how would you know? How would yeah, you know? You'd never have any idea that the story was going to unravel in that way. But as you say, all the conditions were set. Yeah. I mean, there's just this kind of set of amazing historical conditions that allowed her story to happen the way it did. Yeah. And that's why I think it's still, I mean, we're still drinking. Yeah, here we are. Drinking, <laughs> drinking, <it's> still. <laughs> drinking that wine, that still. Thank you, madame. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. So, what a, there's, yeah. so then there's some other, there's some other points. Up until that point of you, now I'm trying to think about you spending years probably yeah. researching and living and, and breathing and, and, and frustration and tears and joy and love and all of those wrapped into one trying yeah. to find the information. Yeah. Because the big money question is like, what was your process? You right. Know, but, well, we could break it down to maybe that part there. Right. I can't even begin. Yeah. I know where you began. Well, so the story begins for me, at least, in a great way. If you look at the book, it's dedicated to two girlfriends, Noelle and Roberta. Yeah. And that's because the, and I say a little bit about that in, yeah. the, in the preface to the book. For the way the book begins is that I was a huge champagne fan, right? I had gone to a graduate school in Seattle and, um, you know, this was the 90s in Seattle back when you could still buy a bottle of Leonetti for 25 bucks <laughs> and you could still get it and you could drink it if you're a graduate student. And then after that, my first academic job had been in in Corvallis, Oregon, and, you know, at Oregon State University and beautiful place, not a whole lot to do yeah. <laughs> other than to get a mean game of croquet <laughs> and to drink Pinot Noir. Uh, so I was really, really into wine. And then the next job that my ex-husband and now ex-husband and I got was in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Right. And it was a really unhappy job. Like Wisconsin was great, but the job itself was really unhappy. 
And so I met these two women who still are really good friends. And we became friends because we agreed that Veuve Picot Champagne was our favorite champagne. Oh, that's a great story. So we would get together once a semester. We would call them VC nights. And we would get together once a semester and we'd each bring a bottle of champagne <laughs> and get together and we'd complain about our boss. And then our husbands would drive us home. And um, it started really as a joke among girlfriends where I, I mean, just like this, sitting here, I looked at it one day and I said, oh, you know, Vuv is widow in French. I wonder, so the widow Clicquot, I wonder if there really was a widow Clicquot. And so in just a kind of a joke, I began doing some research and I would come and each time we would have a Vuv Clicquot night, I'd be like, oh, and then there's a story of this lady and this is what she did. And so she became kind of our mascot in a way. And so I said just one, one day to these girlfriends, you know, someday, like someday when my, when I have tenure as a professor or someday when, you know, someday when, right. right? All of those ways in which we tell ourselves someday when. So someday when something else has happened in the future, I'll do the thing I want to do, which is I'm going to write the story of this book. And I was really lucky because I had girlfriends who said, you know, you shouldn't wait to do that. You should do the thing you really want to do now. Of course, I ignored the advice of the girlfriends and carried on doing things until I was one day in the Huntington Library here in in San Marino, California, Uh and um, was meant to be working on something else. And I came across um, a travel narrative from the 19th century describing this person who had gone to go and visit the Widow Clicquot. And what I realized is that in that moment, that by the end of her life, she had become one of the greatest tourist attractions of France. Train. And I also thought, okay, like now I know where I could find, yeah, like the train at the yeah. bottom of her, at, yeah. which is the it's, beginning of wine tourism. Uh, right. Right. I mean, yes. when we think about Napa and Sonoma and, mm-hmm. you know, going up there, she's also the person who really had the insight that maybe you wanted to come directly to the proprietor to buy this. Right. So um, at that moment, I thought, oh, you could tell this story, right? This is where you might find the info. So kind of also just on as a flyer, I wrote and I ended up getting an agent and I ended up getting a book contract. And then I needed to figure out now how I actually was going to oh, write shit. this book. Yeah. Was that like, because the book came out 2008, 2009? That's right. The book came out in 2008. And so I would have finished writing it in September of 07 or okay. no, November of 07. And then I would have been writing it the two years before that. So I started writing it in 2005, you know, doing the research oh, yeah. and writing it in 2005. Wow. So... I, there's this. There's this couple of. I have to read a couple of things. One is yeah. this, it, just from the pro, the prologue. So this was just some days. I simply asked the locals in bars and bistros to remember, knowing that remembering and inventing are the close cousins, especially at the distance of two hundred years. We passed the wine from table to table in open bottles, and the chef came out from the kitchen to relax with a cigarette and to listen. And in those moments, her presence was with us. Yeah. Because that was what happened oh, is so I got crazy. there, right? So I get this contract. I yeah. now I'm gonna write my dream book about this woman that I've, you know, I'm I've kind of got a, you know, I've fallen in love with yeah. her kind of from the history distance of time. And I already love her champagne. And so I go to France and I rented a fabulous house. This was in January, and um rented this house in a windy field mm-hmm. in the middle of vineyards, a house called La Ravenne. Uh, she could still rent. It's actually still available for rent. I've rented it a couple of other oh, times cool. for like big parties yeah. in my life. That's cool. And um, and I go and I um, got access at Veuve Clicquot um, to the archives. Yeah. And I went in and I thought, oh, I've got access to the Veuve Clicquot archives. And I walk in and there are these rooms full of full of shelves, full of full of information. I'm like, okay, I'm all set. Right? right. This is going to be really easy. And then the archivists and I start going through what's in the archives. And the thing about the Widow Clicquot is that she saved every single land record, you know, how many pounds of grapes that she ended up getting off a particular crop, how much she paid for bottles, wow. all of the business records. Right. She saved every single piece of it. Wow. I and mean, there were rows and rows and rows. But she didn't think that her own personal story was worth saving. No. So she didn't keep that. She didn't keep the things about, you know, what she thought when she was alone at night and yeah. her, she was about ready to go bankrupt because the business nearly failed several times before she achieved success and she might have lost it all. Right. So it was really at that moment I thought, well, you know, what I want to understand is not just the history of the business, but I want to know, I want to know who the person behind yeah. the story was. 
And the thing that is amazing in that passage that you read is that in France, she still lives as a folk heroine. So when you go and drive down the road and pull over and you ask the vignerons who are working in the fields, you know, I'm here to do, I'm here to write about La Veuve Clicquot. Can you tell me about the Veuve Clicquot? They can all, they all know the story of the Veuve Clicquot, right? And I was interested in, well, what does it mean for this woman who at the end of her life became a great tourist attraction? Right. And then by, um, you know, centuries later, still lives in folklore. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's like asking somebody to tell you about Robin Hood, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? She was not a Robin Hood figure, but, um, you know, to tell you that kind of yeah. a legend that she really lived in the sort of hearts and the soul of people there. Yeah. And yet she herself didn't think that her story, oh. you know, that the private part, she didn't think that it was, that she was worth, she didn't think she had a story that was worth saving. That's so like, good. That was yeah, amazing to amazing. me. She seemed like she was... She was a woman when I, I mean, there's only a certain amount of pictures of her yeah. and they're all, you know, she looks a certain way. There's not any pictures of, of really that I've found of her being young. No, they're girl, really taken but, when she's an older woman. An woman. older yeah. woman. And so did you find any, anything that you could describe of what she looked like when she was younger? younger? Yeah. So she's kind of short maybe, but. What I, we know is that she was not very pretty. Oh. And interestingly, I mean, it's a terrible thing to say right. about somebody, right? right? You know, but, as if we should judge people on that. But, but in yeah. her story, that mattered because you know, she gets married in this arranged marriage in her 20s. And she's not beautiful. She's very short. She's described as, you know, extremely short. And, you know, I. And I just think it was very plain yeah, and, and sturdy, sturdy and plain yeah. and not, but she was never considered a great beauty. And so the chances of who you were going to marry her off to in an arranged marriage were marred by that. And then what happens is that Francois dies, right? Yeah. I mean, so she, but I don't think I'm, it's not a spoiler, right? She right, becomes right, the no, widow, right. Clico. Becomes, <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, oh my God, kid. I can't. Oh my God, I'm giving it all away. <laughs> <laughs> so she becomes the widow, Clico, quite early. Uh, quite early, after quite just a few years. In her 20s, yeah, still. And I think if she had been really beautiful, yeah. that she would have been pressured to have remarried. Mm. But because she was not beautiful, right. I think that they accepted that the chance of her remarrying successfully was not, you know, yeah. wasn't very high. And so she was allowed, because she was not beautiful, the freedom that other women wow. might not have been allowed in her position. That's really interesting. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. And... So then, so her strength in that sense, she was just, it was pure in the sense of her, that's, how do I say this? Without, I mean, beauty, sometimes people can't see past that. Exactly. Right. It just the reality, especially right. the 1700s, right. early 1800s, but the, her ability then, you have to see past her. So she, you know, she decides that she's going to do the wine. She wants her, her inheritance. <laughs> she has her, her stepped up for a million dollars. I know. Can you believe To gamble on a, so why do you think that he said yes? Not even twice, I think he said. Yes, yeah. exactly. Twice. So the story is that um, is yeah so so her um, her husband dies and her husband has been really interested before he dies in developing a wine business, right? I mean this is a, it begins as his passion okay. and I think it's in part because he knows nothing about the wine business and they've just gotten married that and you know it really is a an arranged marriage yeah. like you said and so he says. He welcomes his young wife to come and ride out in the countryside with him while he's doing this tour, trying to learn this business. Right. And so she does learn the business in that way. Yeah. And in the process, they actually really quite genuinely fall in love with each other. So mm. it's kind so of... it's kind of a sweet... It's a really... It's a yeah. sweet story. I mean, it's, it's sad. It has so many twists and turns. Yeah. just like the whole champagne the whole industry. Thing, I mean, yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, so they fall in love over wine, right? right? And for me, you know, that was always part of my own story as well, right? right? You know, because... Because, you know, not to jump ahead, but I know I write in the book. I mean, I, I wrote this, I finished this book in the midst of a divorce, yeah. right? So, you know, you think about, you yeah. know, falling in love over wine and loss and, you know, yeah. you talk about those crossroads of grief and opportunity, yep. right? That were so important for her and so inspiring. So what happens is then he dies. And, you know, there were, nobody knows how he died exactly. Yeah, which is a little suspect or maybe it, not. I don't yeah, well, they thought maybe what they said at the time, like, I don't think it really matters how he died. Yeah, right. What matters is that the gossip at the time was that he died, he committed suicide because the business that mm -hmm. he had wanted to start and had convinced his father to right. give him money to try to start the champagne business, which would have been at that point, not a making of a champagne, but really a, a Di export business. Distribution of yeah, the, yeah. Was failing. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, I think that's the important part about, right. you know, that by the time she comes to her father-in-law, Philippe, yeah. we're already talking about a failing business idea. Right. And she comes to the father-in-law and says, you know, I know that Francois 
could not make this champagne business work. Any chance you would gamble the equivalent of a million dollars today to let me try? And astonishingly, her father-in-law says yes, even though she's had no business training, no real experience. She's a woman. Women of her class aren't supposed to run businesses. And amazingly, he says yes to her. And as a writer, what I think is, we're always looking for those moments where something doesn't make sense yeah. in a story. Right? It doesn't make sense it's okay, that it's you a, give a million bucks to somebody who's never run a sense. business. <laughs> no. Which means that you must be in the presence of something really extraordinary in terms of character, mm-hmm. right? So I think that what happened is, is that her father-in-law looked at her and he must have seen in her something really extraordinary and understood <laughs> that she was perhaps capable of doing something that her that his own son hadn't been. And uh-huh. I think if there had been other sons, she also would not have been given the opportunity. Right. But because her he son was, was the only child. His the, his, the her husband. Her husband, not her, her husband. Her husband yeah. Yes. Was his father's was only, only tra- child. So that yeah, was kind sorry, of yes. interesting. I get yeah. chills when I talk about this because I feel like I'm like can be there and understand and it's just yeah. so interesting, intriguing. I mean yeah. it really and the whole I think yeah. if this the allure of champagne, I mean it just goes back to the whole trajectory of it. It's like fascinating. Yeah. So so now she gets the million dollars, right? Yep. And so now when you're learning about this maybe halfway through the book, are you back and forth in France and then back in Napa or up in Healdsburg? I know you were yep. doing a lot of work yep. up there in the Yeah, exactly. I was living actually in Katati, uh, well, living in Katati in Pengrove, California, okay. which is just outside, um, which is just out, just south of, between Petaluma and Santa Rosa, one of those little small towns right by Sonoma State okay. University. Yeah. So that's where we were based out of. And yeah, so I was, exactly. I, I mean, I write about that in the book that I was living in Californian wine country, um, primarily at that point in Sonoma, uh-huh. but you know, I also have really good friends in Napa. And so... One of the ways I did the, I mean, I did the historical research in the champagne, but I also wanted to learn about how champagne was made and about women in the wine industry. And so reached out to a couple of the women um, champagne style, sparkling wine, right, champagne so right. makers. I know we're not allowed Don't to say champagne. Domain? And was it Eileen Domain, Crane? Like, Eileen, Eileen Crane yeah, Eileen at Domain yeah, Carneros right. was hugely helpful. Yeah, and then so. Ava Bertrand at Gloria Ferrer. Yeah, great. Were the two women I reached out to who were both you know, amazing, yeah. amazing women of the vine, right. as we now say, <laughs> right? Um, and so I um, had reached out to them to talk about, you know, really how is it that champagne is made and you know, what's the, what is the sort of legacy of women in the wine industry and um, just what are some of the technical yeah. parts of it? Um, and especially Eileen gave me lots of information. She's an amazing wine she maker. She is. She's great. And how, so, so you, ha- so now you're going back, I'm trying to understand too at this point. So you have this amazing story. You're, you're getting all this information. You're kind of living it. You're probably drinking, some, <laughs> looking for <laughs> answers. Doing and- <laughs> some, some, some first hand research. <laughs> you know, a lot of first hand research. I do my research. <laughs> right, right. Never want to skip <laughs> to not skimping your research, right? Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> mm. And then I'm trying to, and then there's, 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 there's all this time and you're in California and you're kind of threading the story of women in wine and trying to, is that a way to help kind of bring your focus or understanding on how she affected the current industry or women in wine? I'm trying to... Yeah, exactly. I mean, really, one of the things that I realized in the course of doing the research about the Widow Clicquot is that, for one thing, wine tourism, as we know it, wouldn't exist without her and then with one of the next generation of young champagne widows who, yeah. you know, she's, I think, a mentor to and a competitor of, in some yeah. ways, Madame Pomeray, Louise Pomeray. Louise Pomeray. Yeah. I mean, these are the two women yeah. who really have the insight that establishes the idea of modern wine tourism. So, you know, you, I mean, here I am living in Napa in Sonoma, and you see all of these amazing, you know, experiences that tourists can have, and you see right. all these tourists coming and having right. them. And you realize that, you know, that the, and it's a huge part of the California industry. Yeah. I mean, what is it that after Disney, Napa and Sonoma are the second most popular wow. tourist site yeah, in California? I don't know that. That's crazy. I in mean, the eighth largest economy in the world, right? And, so I mean, must, and that all threads back to and it threads back to this woman, wow. right? And it's like, and you know, you think about what the legacy of that is. But the other thing that 
without her. I mean, so champagne before the Widow Clicquot was, it already existed as a right, drink. Right, doesn't like to get into what, what, But it, <laughs> it was really a drink of kings and yeah. queens, right? I mean, it was... Um, I mean, even the glass bought, everything was different. Yeah. So if you want to talk about maybe just, there's the glass, there was, was maybe no label, it was sweet. Well, that was the bubbles thing that no was... bubbles, the, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, <laughs> much fewer, many, many fewer bubbles, so much more lightly pétillant. So yeah, so before... Um, so champagne already existed, you know, before, obviously, the beginning of late 18th, early 19th century. Um, but interestingly, when you go back to the story of someone like Dom Perignon, yeah. <laughs> Dom Perignon did not invent champagne, right? Dom Perignon was charged as the cellar master in OVA with finding a way to fix the problem that was ruining the wine of the monks. Because what they knew is that in the champagne, they could make a very, very northern wine growing climate. What they knew is that they could make a really nice white still wine mm -hmm. and the monks would make it and they would put them in the casks. And then in the spring, when the weather got warm, it would turn out that the fermentation mm -hmm. hadn't finished and that they would begin to fizz again. So it was like it was laid dormant in the cold cellars. And then when you, all of a sudden they woke up like, oh, we're going to eat the, like, we're, we're going to keep eat eating the yeast. <laughs> exactly. Um, the yeast is going to keep eating the sugar. sugar and so yeah. we get bubbles again. And so they were trying, the monks were making money by exporting their wine primarily to the British market, right? Mm. Because one of the other things, and I know the French government, you know, okay. the French government okay. hates it when I say this, but, and it's not my, you know, I want to give yeah. credit to Tom Stevenson, who's the person who, who discovered this and documented it as a wine scholar. The French did not even invent how to make champagne. It was the English. Yes. They had a much stronger tradition of cider making. So they knew how to control secondary fermentations ah. and they had much stronger glassware the in glass, the 17th the, century. That's a whole other... Because they had forests yeah. and they were able to have fires at a hotter temperature. Because so, why they had forests and so... Well, they had forests yeah. and so they were able to make charcoal. Oh, they were just able to have so cool, natural they? resources that allowed them to have hotter fires in oh. order to have glass foundries. It's such an interesting that's thing, so right? so interesting. About how just the how? kinds of natural resources you have oh. determine the kinds of kinds of like drinks you can have. Right. I'm like, okay, like buy land near a forest. Note to self, right? When the apocalypse comes, we need glassware for our shit. Right, totally get to buy a forest. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. So, um, so what happens is uh, Dom Perignon is charged with figuring out how to get rid of the bubbles. And fortunately for us, Dom Perignon fails in yes. this mission. Yes. But what had happened was that the monks were exporting their wine to Britain and the Brits knew that because they had this cider making tradition that you buy these casks. And as soon as you open a cask, now you're looking at oxygen ruining your wine. Mm -hmm. So they put them in bottles and everybody knew that if you put a little bit of brandy in, that was a preservative right. and it would prevent your wine going off. But of course, brandy is also a bit of sugar, right? right? And there's still yeast in it. And so that started the secondary fermentation. Uh -huh. So that was really how the notion of champagne, the wine yeah. of champagne, the sparkling wine of champagne got started. Uh -huh. And the French very quickly realized what the British were doing and they decided, okay, well, we better start doing this, yeah. right? Like, obviously there's a market for right. this. So, you know, we could put it in a bottle too. people over, like the salespeople, quote unquote, or, or something. Exactly. That's how they learned. Right, the monks and the, yeah. and the trade, okay. the negotiants, right? The, negotiants, the people who yeah. are doing the distribution, yeah. which is what her husband, both Clicquot's husband had wanted to do. So they begin doing it, but it's not a it's not a mass cultural product, in part because it's so different in style. So you know, like we can talk later about the brute champagne yeah. and like the whole thing with Madame Pomeray, and which is a great story yeah. about the invention of the double label, the yellow label. Yeah. But so what had happened is that the wine at that time was incredibly sweet. So you were not talking about a dry sparkling like this wine. Is a that we're this is a brew, yes. so this has not got a lot of sugar. Mm -hmm. But if you had if you had this in the beginning of the 18th or you know even the end of the 18th century when um, Madame Clicquot was beginning the wine trade, you know her involvement in it, you would get it in a little V-shaped glass about this big, and this is about how much you'd get, and it would have just the little stem, right, the uh, cordial glass kind yeah, of yeah. stuff, and it would have or it might have, if you were at the bottom of the bottle, it might have a little bit of gunk at the bottom, mm -hmm. right? Because it was really it, difficult to get the yeast out yeah. afterwards. And then it would be frozen to the point of almost slush. Oh. And it would have 300 grams, of, might have 300 grams of residual sugar. So you think about like a Chateau Yquem, yeah. right? Like a Sauterne. Yeah. That's maybe 170, oh 180 gosh. grams of residual sugar. So you're talking about something almost as sweet as one of the sweetest dessert wines on the market. 
And sugar and ice were both incredibly rare luxury commodities Mm. in that period, right? Interesting. So then the whole... So really, it was the drink of kings and queens and the aristocracy. It was not something that, you know, people like you and me would ever dream of. Yeah, we we couldn't do this, right? So thank goodness for the French Revolution, (laughs) (laughs) right? And Madame Clicquot was really the person who, along with Jean-Rémy Moet, helped in the Napoleonic era move champagne from being this just elite drink to being a mass market luxury product. And always that irony of like, what does it mean to have an artisanal product that still is luxury and handcrafted, but is also available broadly? Right. That's that's her legacy. That is, uh, and that's interesting. And I mean, we have, we're talking about, Vogue. we have to talk a little bit about, of course, her contributions. We talked about the wine tourism, which is something that is so interesting because I didn't really, I don't know if other people, I didn't really broaden my perspective on that until I uh, heard you speaking about it and writing about it. But that's huge. That was one of her huge contributions. But the other one that she's known for, there's a few others, but what's what's the other one? Well, the other big technical (laughs) innovation is riddling, right? So I have to back up just a tiny bit to tell that story, right? (laughs) So, okay, so she goes to her father-in-law. So her husband has died. She goes to her father-in-law and says, can I have the million bucks to try? (laughs) And he amazingly says, okay. But the first time he says, all right, but you're going to do a four-year apprenticeship. I will give you the million bucks to try this and the business. Four-year apprenticeship. I'm going to choose the business person in the trade. And it's basically a crash MBA, as it were. Did he partner with somebody you think that was, was it strategic or was it simply... It was strategic, I think. He found a really good person, a man named Alexander Fourneau, uh-huh. who was an extremely experienced local negociant wow. and was probably as successful as anybody in the Champagne at that time doing it. Fourneau is the man who founded the company that is today Tatinger's. Oh. So another kind of neat wow. little connection, yeah, right? That's so cool. And um, <laughs> so Fourneau, Alexander Fourneau becomes her kind of business partner, but also business mentor. And they open the Veuve Clicquot Champagne, right? You know, the Madame, the Widow Clicquot's yeah. champagne business. And um, with his name also okay, attached his to it. On it too, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, for four years, they try to run this business. And at the end of four years, Alexandre Fourneau says, I'm out, right? This yeah. is a train wreck. We are not making any money. This yeah. business is a disaster. There's no real way in the middle of what is now a war right. um, with the rise of Napoleon. There's no way with the ways in which international trade right. are, are being problematized by the war. So he says, I'm done. They've lost the money again. There's been no financial success. At that moment, the widow Clico goes back to her father-in-law and says, <laughs> any chance of another million bucks? <laughs> I've learned my lessons. I've learned my lessons. I know that didn't work out so great. So could we do a do-over? But that's impressive. And amazingly, I mean, he says a second time, yes. Wow. Right? So he must have really something. seen in her something astonishing. Yeah. And I rather think it's like, as a woman, I think it's a great story of the ways in which like, here is this guy who by all rights, shouldn't be supporting a yeah. daughter-in-law doing something right. like this. And he's he's willing to give her this yeah, chance. That I just think it's a, a great story. It's a great story. And it says a lot probably about who she was or what he saw in her that yeah. we aren't, weren't able to, to see right. on paper. or Exactly. Right. Whatever it was about herself and her private, yeah. you know, this sort of forcefulness of her personality, that was one of the things that we can infer from the story, but that was the part of her own life story that she just didn't think was worth saving, wow. right? I mean, we know that she had all these letters and she must have talked about the challenges and the heartbreak. And that was all the stuff that she just didn't think anybody would care about that. Right? Wow, I mean, yeah, that's... Which is really sad. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for her, she also, I mean, she in some ways thought about that business as part of a love story, right? That. You know, she had really genuinely fallen in love with her husband and this was the thing he had wanted. And I think part of her thought, you know, damn it, I'm like, I'm going to yeah. do this, right? This right. is how this is how I'm going to honor that vision that we had together right. of what our life was going to be. Yeah. And so I think she was hugely committed to that. I think for her father-in-law, that was also part of probably the emotional right. appeal, right? So she, she does. She, he gives her the equivalent of another million dollars. <laughs> And so that she knows that this is her last possible chance mm-hmm. to run this business. And this is, uh, you know, 1810, 1811. Okay. And so there were two great vintages in the 19th century in the Champagne. And 
the greatest of them was the vintage of 1811. And it was known as the vintage of the year of the comet because I think it was Halley's Comet. It was one of the big comets that struck across the sky. And this was seen superstitiously as a portent, right, of the fall of Napoleon because they're in the midst of the Napoleonic Wars. And her competitor is a man named Jean-Rémy Moet, Mm -hmm. Moet and Chandon, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, he is the most established, most important champagne wine dealer of the period. And he does not have an enlightened view about the role of women. Right. He just it's, thinks it's, this is not, should not be happening. That's what I thought. And he has captured the Russian market, which is the most important market at that moment for French champagne. And so she knows that she's on the brink in 1813, 1814. She knows that she's on the brink of bankruptcy and that there will not be a third chance. And she knows that she has in her cellars maybe you know close to 10,000 bottles of what she already knows is the most amazing wine. And so she comes up with a plan and she decides that she realizes that the Napoleonic Wars are coming to a conclusion and that whoever can get their champagne into Russia first, because Russia hasn't been able to get any French champagne because of the embargoes, the war has shut down trade. Yeah. Whoever can get their champagne into the Russian market first can capture market share. And she wants to capture some of Jean-Rémy Moet's market share and save her business. So she comes up with a plan to smuggle, to basically run the barricades and right. to smuggle her wine. <laughs> no, this, <laughs> this, far. This, this is like, the, this is like, there was so many points of that importance. And this is just the one that just... It's, it's so, so amazing, amazing, right? I mean, yeah. so she just decides, you know, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to gamble everything. I'm going to, I am going to roll the dice and I'm going to risk everything. And I'm going to take this amazing wine and I'm going to, too late in the year, right? She's sending it in June when the weather is already hot and the champagne might explode on board because of the heat. So there's double risk. I mean, so there's, because you don't know. And you don't know what the quality of the wine will be. Not only might it just be destroyed, but it might get there and it all might be gunk, right? Because they couldn't control malolactic fermentation at that time. Oh my gosh. So you might get there and it might be slimy, right? And you went to all this expense and effort and you've destroyed this this once in a century vintage. But she says, you know, I don't, to herself, you know, I don't have any choice, right? This is, this is all or nothing. And so she has an employee, a man named Louis Bone, who I always think has kind of a crush on her. I mean, I think yeah. there was an unrequited love affair on his part yeah. as well. And, um, and so she sends him, because she can't go, right? So she has to trust somebody else to do this. So she ch- sends Louis Bone, and he agrees to smuggle the wine out of France secretly. And they have to be so secretive because if Jean-Rémy Moet has yeah. any idea what they're doing and he does the same thing, right. then everybody will buy the product they recognize and they won't buy right. this unknown champagne. So they so, have to put it on a boat. Are they going on a boat and sh- kind exactly. of trying to get through some like You've got to go tricky. through the rivers. They put it on the river boats wow. and the barges and then... Sneakily put it... I mean, this is so cool. Like this is just Total story. stealth, exactly. Yeah. Because if anybody... I mean, of course, if you're a... You know, you're in a war and you realize that somebody is illegally putting a bunch of wine on a boat. Like, that's the boat you're going to capture. <laughs> right? I mean, so, and that Definitely. was always the risk, too, is, right. that the, is that it would be confiscated, that the boat right. would, be dis, would be discovered. Because they're really running the, the war blockades, you know, an embargo. So, she sends Louis Bon. I always think it's like one of the sweetest uh-huh. things. She gives Louis Bon um, a bottle of really good French brandy. And she sends him with a copy of Cervantes' Don Quixote. You know, the idea of the knight errant is tilting at impossible windmills, right? Yes. And he goes wow. and he gets there and he makes it to the port um, on, at the border of Russia. And the war does end as she's anticipated. And John Rumi Moet has not had the same idea. And we get these letters that Louis Bone sends back to her. And he says, you know, Madame, you know, I can't even unload the wine. They buy it so fast. There are people lined up at the wharves to buy your champagne. And it is perfect. We didn't lose a bottle. The condition. I know. It's every. It was perfect. The conditions. And he he writes back and he says, don't worry, I've doubled the price. (laughs) A good Sorry, business man. A good business man. And within a month, wow. the Tsar of Russia declares that he won't drink anything else. And suddenly, he Madame, won't drink anything else except the, except the, the, the champagne except of the widow Clicquot, of the Veuve Clicquot. And so, within within a month, she becomes this iconic, uh, this you know, world famous wow. figure in the European world context. Wow. And everybody knows who Madame Clicquot is, and the champagne of the widow Clicquot is what every it becomes just this you know celebrity product that yeah. everybody is dying for. So, but now back at home, she has a huge problem 
which is she's just uh, captured market share. Right. And now she doesn't have any more champagne right. to ship. She probably wasn't even thinking of, right? I mean, would, I don't like, think she was. <laughs> she's thinking, I got to move this really, this, I gotta, yeah, and yeah. one thing at a time, right. right? So in the one thing at a time, she's thinking, you know, get the product there. And now the orders are coming in and she doesn't have the product. And she knows that she has wine in the cellars that's coming in the pipeline. Oh, yeah. But the thing about champagne yeah. is that it's a really slow, you, you, can't, you can't cheat on champagne. Yeah. It's a handmade product. And she knows that she has it almost ready, but that it's in the final stages of, of remuage, right? right. Of, of getting rid of. So, you know, what happens is you, you take the still wine okay. and you have your white still wine and you put in a little bit of brandy, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of yeast again, right? And you cork it and you put it on its side. And even for a non-vintage champagne, you're talking about 18 months minimum right. that it has to rest you know, rest while it's fermenting yeah. really slowly. But for a vintage champagne, you might be looking at five or seven years yeah, it's, easily, it's right? A really long, long time. time. But then you end up, so then it's done. And then this, the carbon dioxide is trapped in here and the yeast dies and consumes the sugar. And then the problem is you're left at the bottom of the bottle with a layer of gunk, right? right. Like, what are you going to do? <laughs> Nobody wants like floaty bits in <laughs> their champagne, right? So the old fashioned way I think we should pour ourselves a I bit more and I'll like, show I you. I do want it was that. I felt like you uh, should pour some more. So the old-fashioned way was that you would store a bottle like this okay. and all of the yeast would come in the bottle. And there was a very fancy French word called transvasage, which was basically but, pouring it from one bottle to another. So basically you're going like this. Uh-huh. Kind of trying and to, trying to leave the gunk in the bottle. Oh my gosh. And as you can imagine, like, I mean, look what happens when we pour champagne, oh my right? Gosh, right. The idea that you're going to pour a whole bottle out repeatedly and try to leave the gunk in the bottom you're going to throw away a lot of wine, but you're also going to lose a lot of the bubbles, right? Wow. So, and it's incredibly slow because after each pouring, you have to wait for oh it gosh. to settle down again. Is that 10,000 bottles trying to do? Uh, Can you imagine? imagine? Which would end up being like 5,000 bottles. <laughs> yes, no, yeah, I remember, well, exactly. It's, by the time you're done, like it's totally it's, inefficient. Yeah. So the widow Clicquot was thinking and she needed to expedite it. And so she said one day to the people in the cellar, like, look, guys, I have an idea. I'd like you to take my kitchen table down and I want you to just drill some holes in it. You know, I'm like, like take these suckers and let's turn them upside down. Right? So wait, wait. So she said, like, take my kitchen table and drill holes in my table into, my into cellar. the cellar. Into my cellar. The chalk cellar kind of went near where I got caves. Paid. Exactly. Right. Drill, drill some holes in it. We're going to take them. We're going to turn them upside down. And then all the yeast will end up in the neck of the bottle. Wow. And all the guys looked at her and like, no, madame, that's not how we do that. It will never work. No, c'est pas possible, Right. And she's like, look, take the table down into the cellar and drill the holes in the table. Like, really, just do it. And she does, and she turns them upside down. And then what happens is that, and you have to turn the bottle as you do it so that the yeast doesn't get stuck on the sides, but ends up all right in a little glob, oh. inelegantly enough. So it has, in the, it has it point to it. Like oh, a plug. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Otherwise, you end up with it here. Mm. So, so, and then the idea would be that you'd lift it up and you would hold the bottle and you got to have a really lightning thumb. You would pop the top off. You would let the yeast spray out. And then you would put your thumb back over it and you pull it back up and you just fill it back up neatly to the top and you cork that sucker. And you would save yourself months of work oh and gosh. you you save way more of the champagne. And more importantly, you don't damage the quality of the bubbles. Right. So this was her innovation. And for us now, we look at it and we think, you know, how obvious. Like, right. of course you turn it upside down. I mean, but that was not something anybody wow. had ever considered. So she invented that method. And so if you go to the Champagne Now or sometimes in antique stores in France, you'll see the riddling racks. Yeah. And they're like the, like the A-frames with the holes in them. Yeah. And that is basically just a... It's a version of Madame Clicquot's dining room table with the holes in it. And they just hinge it. And the reason they do that is to save floor space. Oh, so that right? you can... So you can put more in a smaller space just to save space. Wow. So still to this day in the champagne, that is how a vintage champagne is made is it's hand riddled. And All she's... All vintages are. Vintage champagnes are hand riddled. They don't have that gy- with the the gyro, gyro palette. palette yeah, no, I mean, you know, for non-vintage or for it's, big producers, yeah. you'll get the gyro palette. But for vintage champagnes, you can still go wow. and there's a Riddler and someone was like, really, <laughs> really talk about carpal tunnel. Right, talk about carpal tunnel, <laughs> right? right? Repetitive My stress. Gosh. But who can go and they turn the bottle. It's so cool. It's really great it's to so watch. Cool. If you ever have the chance also yeah. to go, I mean, they, you know, either at Napa and Sonoma where yeah. they have the houses that I know like Gloria Ferrer um, has a tour that shows that. 
or in the champagne. It's really neat to yeah. watch how somebody does that. That's so cool. That's pretty cool. So that is the technical innovation that she makes, but she also speeds up the production process and the quality so that, she, I mean, it brings the cost of champagne down, right? It's part of why champagne is then able to become a mass market luxury product is you've just solved uh, one of the technical huge you know bottlenecks yeah. if you were <laughs> that's funny <laughs> right we're going to pause this episode just for a moment so i can tell you a few things follow us on instagram at forking podcast on facebook Debbie.Salzberg, that's D-E-B-I dot Salzburg. And my email, because I would love some feedback on what you enjoyed about this episode. And also I love when people just reach out and say hi and introduce themselves. My email directly is dsalty00, that's D-S-A-L-T-Y 00 at gmail.com. You can always shoot a uh, contact um, from the website, just forking around dot net. Now let's get back to the episode. I try to picture her sitting at the dining room table, like that table or something. <laughs> Give like, me a drill. <laughs> <laughs> or thinking of how yeah. to get that going into solution because now I have to fill the bottles. Like now there was, we did that one hurdle. Right. It was a huge hurdle. Now we got the champagne there. 10, yeah. Now there's this demand. Right. And now how are we going to fill right. that? And then there is also the other part to it that I think is really cool is the secrets. And this also... Kind of, right? That's my favorite part of the story, too. <laughs> the secret. Because Jean Remy Moet, uh, I mean, so she looks at it and she says, okay, well, now I have this competitive advantage. And Jean Remy Moet, like, you can read some of his letters, and his letters are not, like, they're just not super supportive, yeah, right. to put it mildly. <laughs> and so he, um, she knows that if he figures out how she's doing this, then he'll do it too. And then the chance for her to build the business and really, you know, establish herself, she might lose it again to Jean Remy Moet. And anyhow, you know, he's convinced that women shouldn't do this. And that just kind of ticks her off. So I always think this is an amazing part of her story, too. She, she asks her workers in what is really a small community to keep the secret of what is happening yeah. in her cellars. So you get chills again. I mean, and, that's, it's imagine time because yeah. it is a small community. So therefore, everybody knows. Everybody in the raising are married with each other yeah, and they so all know each other. The coffee in the morning and the cafe. People, you know, have their wine in the, the afternoon. It, and yes, right. I mean, it. it's so, it'd be so easy to just... Oopsie, oopsie, yeah. right? Oh yeah, she's got a table and she turns it upside down. That's how. It's, oh, bingo, right? Can't believe that that wasn't least. Uh, no, I can't That's believe it amazing. wasn't either. And it was years. I mean, I just think it's you know a sign of you know another one of those things that tells us a huge important thing about who she was that her employees kept that secret not for a month and not for a week, but for a matter of years. Wow. It was years before Jean Remy Moet understood what she was doing, and there are these fabulous letters now where he writes, I don't understand how this woman is doing this. It's like, what is she doing? <laughs> He's going crazy. It's driving He's, him nuts, yeah, he right? I mean, so, yeah. And of course, you know, Jean-Rémy Moet is a wonderful, you know, winemaker himself. Right. And um, and today, Veuve Clicquot and Moet and Chateau LM, are owned yeah, by the same LM, company. So LVMH. LVMH, yeah. yes. Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy now yeah. owns it. So, um, so you know that. So, you know, I think it's for the widow Clicquot, she would think that was very interesting. Yeah, I think she would yeah. think so too. But, um, but so for her, I, I always think that's part of just this lovely pleasure that, you know, she captured the market share and then she had the loyalty of the employees who kept the secret. And there's, I just love the whole story. And then there's something very interesting too about the label. But before we get to the label, when yeah. when you find when you when you're scribing this book and getting information in this book, it must have been hard for you to catalog the time frames and how to scribe the book because all the information seems like it was probably came this way, mm -hmm. which would be, you know, vertical instead of horizontal. Right. Exactly. And that's one of the problems you run into as a biographer is, you know, she has, I mean, the, there's this narrow window of her life where this really amazing life-changing stuff happens. And then she lives for 50 years. And you're kind of like, well, how do I, I mean, and yeah. she does really cool things as an oh, older lady, right. but, um, but, you know, it's that, um, you know, she's really at that point, it's the, it's the effects of the things that happen in her 20s and 30s right. and early 40s. Yeah, and then, and then she lives to be 100. Right. You know, not, you know, <laughs> or 90 something. something, yeah. And so, so you know, like, how do you yeah, tell the story? Yes. So that was, that was tricky. I mean, there are some parts of her story later in her life 
that are really interesting. Like the banking and all the that. Banking, the banking. Yeah. Like yeah. she decides to overextend <laughs> at one point in part because, you know, I mean, she might have been 28 and a widow, but, you know, it's clear that she she did have, she did fall in love with people at different moments. She or had crushes. some love crushes. She had some crushes and she didn't make some great, I mean, we all can understand, you know, not making great decisions in the midst of, you know, being in love. and. Right. She ended up trusting um, one employee in particular yeah. that she had a crush on, who very nearly bankrupted her. Right. And um, but yet she then came back. Well, I mean, she was yeah, yeah, she came back, and so she made it through that. But she did, and you know, I think the story of her relationship with her son-in-law. So she does with Francois did have a daughter named Clementine. So when she went with, when was a widow, she, their daughter was like three. Or yeah, something. it was there a was baby, baby. Exactly. Clementine, a toddler. which was like her grandmother's name or something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Exactly. So it was an old family name. And she did not think, she did not want her daughter to go into, I mean, ironically, she did the same thing her father did. She did not want her daughter to be a businesswoman. She married her daughter off instead into the into the French aristocracy. Yeah. To the was Comte Clementine de a good-looking woman, girl? I think, I think she, she was. was. I think so, yeah. too. Yeah, all of Both the... from your description. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, I think she was... Um, yes, I think she was, because I think there's even letters that say that. That the widow Clicquot's view was that her daughter was very pretty, but she under... Or, you know, maybe Clementine really wasn't very clever, or maybe her mother underestimated yeah. her intelligence. But her mother's view was that she was a pretty object, but she was not very clever, and she certainly was not in her mother's view, a forceful enough woman to be capable of running a business. Yeah, and so she... She married her off to the Comte, to Louis le Comte de Chevigny, and um, who was a feckless, just rake player of yeah. an aristocrat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think Madame Clicquot had a bit of a crush on him as well. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, one of my, the, I mean, it's, it's a poor Clementine, right? One of the funniest stories about it, I think, is that um, at one point... The Comte, the Count, the Count de Chevigny, he, um, even though he had a very generous allowance from Madame Clicquot, who was by then very, very, very wealthy, you know, bankrolled this lavish lifestyle for her son-in-law and daughter, he always was managing to spend too much money. He was always coming back for more money for another palace kind of thing, right? right? Because she becomes I mean, fabulously wealthy. Yeah. I mean, she's really running an empire, a right. business empire at that point, single-handedly. And it's a business she's developed, right? She... She built it from nothing and yeah. she becomes this iconic world figure. So um, he keeps coming back and wanting more money. And finally, she's like, no, you know, <laughs> like you've had enough. You're gambling the money. Yeah. So he comes up with the idea that he will write these erotic poems. And they're about Clementine. I mean, poor Clementine, right? right? They're these dirty, <laughs> dirty kind of locker room poems that he's circulating amongst his friends, thinking that this is somehow cool. And Madame Clicquot finds out about it and she decides that this is not okay. And so her response is she buys up all the copies of the, oh, of the Count's everywhere. poems. Everywhere. <laughs> she just like buys them up and she destroys them. Yes. And of course, he decides that he's got a bestseller on his hand. And so he keeps republishing oh my gosh. them. So every time he wants more money, he <laughs> releases <laughs> some more pornographic poems. And then she goes and buys them all to try to like make sure that they don't actually get out ever. That is... So, yeah. That's like, I didn't know that. That's incredible. <laughs> I thought that that's, was pretty funny. That's really funny. Yeah. That's so, like clever on both ends. Clever on both ends, yes. <laughs> right? Indeed. You know, she should have just put her foot down and been like, no, but no that's, more that's, poems. That's, that's like an interesting thing why she wasn't able to or somehow yeah. do that, you know? It's I think she like, definitely was kind of enamored with him. Yeah. And I think he, you know, I think he was a very charming, flirtatious, you know, elegant man and you know, good probably looking. A good looking okay, and, yeah. you know, probably even good hearted in his own way. But so, yeah. So I, I just can't stop thinking about yeah. the pornographic love letters. <laughs> They're bad too. Yeah, I lost, I lost, I lost all track. I lost the train of thought. I mean, I a little, got a little hot and bothered there thinking about the, the, the 18th so think, century pumps. Right. And I think Clementine must have had to have been yeah. good looking if they were selling. Yeah, I think well, so. Oh, she yeah. was buying Poor them thing. all. Well, then the mom was buying. Yeah, <laughs> Madame Pico was buying them all. So Although you they, can still find them because uh-huh. they did ultimately get out because she couldn't buy all of them. I, so amazingly, you still can find rare copies in the 19th century of the Comte de Chevigny's poems. Yeah. So. so okay, so then when this ha- so now I want to talk a little bit about this this label because I know yeah. there wasn't a label for a while. That's right, and, and so, then it wasn't the yellow, label. and it wasn't the yellow. And there's something special mm-hmm. about this yellow, and yeah. So this is another great part of the story, right? I mean, Madame Clicquot makes you know a couple of mistakes in her long life, right. and the thing is that she's a smart enough lady to know that she's made them. So 
toward the end of her life, another of the famous champagne widows, Louise Pomeray, right, um, comes onto the scene really a, two generations later um, at the very end of Do you think of because of Madame? Of yeah, both, absolutely. Be, like, she opened the, the way for women to be able to do that. Yeah. And then Lily Bollinger came afterwards. Right. The difference is that Lily Bollinger and um, Louise Pomeray, they didn't develop the businesses. They inherited oh, champagne right. businesses from right. husbands who had already established the business. So really, Madame Clicquot is the only one to take a business from nothing and to single-handedly create the empire, which is why we talk about her as the first, the first, you know, the first international businesswoman in history, right. or the right. first legitimate Legit- <laughs> international right. businesswoman right. in history, yeah. right? Um, although, you know, even then, you know, I mean, she, they sold, you know, champagne as far as the United States, Lapland. I mean, it was sold around the world right. um, during her lifetime. And she really owned a business empire, which is why, you know, I talk about, you know, a champagne empire and right. the woman who ruled it. So what happens is um, Madame Clicquot is still making that really sweet wine. Louise Pomeray had been sent to boarding school in France. Uh, and she, I'm mean, sorry, England, in England, right? in yeah, England. England. And she and Madame Clicquot thought the English don't like champagne. They won't buy champagne. There's no point in my trying to open this market. I keep trying and they keep not buying it. So the English don't like champagne. And Louise Pomeray had gone to boarding school and she's like, it's not that they don't like champagne, they don't like sweet drinks because there's this tradition of dry cider making. So she, Louise Pomeray, had the insight that if you made a brute champagne, a champagne that didn't have sweetness, but that was dry of residual sugar, was fully fermented to dry, that that would sell in the British market. And so that was what she did. She invents brute champagne right. or even brute, brute nature, which is a zero residual, oh. fully dry. And so Louise Pomeray um, begins selling it and she immediately captures the British market. Mm-hmm. The Brits are crazy for Pomeray's champagne. And the widow Clicquot has the grace to realize, I was wrong about that, right? right? That in fact, Louise Pomeray, Madame Pomeray is exactly right. And so she decides, okay, well, let's get in on the business, right? I mean, I was wrong, but it doesn't mean I'm going to, I'm not going to sit here and keep being wrong. And so they begin to make a brute champagne for the Veuve Clicquot Maison. And this is the yellow label that was always intended to market the brute champagne. So you will see the yellow label on, you know, the, the brute champagne yeah. Veuve Clicquot. Um, and that's the history of it. And the other thing is, it's not orange, it's yellow, right? So yeah. <laughs> Like, it's, it's like yellow. the polo classic. It's orange. orange. I know, it's just like one of those things, it's, right? It's you know? yellow, like a, and a certain color yellow or it's just yellow? Like, what do you refer to? It is, well, what the patent is, because it's a okay. trademark color. It is the yellow of the color of the egg yolks of the chicken from Bress, a region in France. Oh. So, yes, but the... Because their know. eggs are natural, so they're yellow. So, so they're like exactly yellow orange. Yellow orange, or, right? Yellow it orange. looks orange. I mean, it but completely looks look, orange, but it's people yellow. in the know... Talk okay. about it as Clico Yellow. <laughs> okay, it's Clico Yellow. Yes, Clico Yellow. That is so interesting. Yeah. And then there are some other interesting with the with the cork. Isn't there the the comet or the? Uh, yeah, the, you'll see on it the comet. Um, mm. So here is let's see. There's the anchor, and the anchor has to, the anchor was very strategic because it was the symbol of Saint Petersburg, which was the Russian market. Oh, really? And um, it was also a symbol of hope, right? Oh, yeah, so right. The symbol. Yeah, it was the two of those things together. But it was really on there in order to in part appeal. You know, to to appeal to the Russian market right. with the kind of symbolism, and then um, there is the comet. Where is the comet? Is it was Let's there a comet see. on there? It's the it's the, it's the uh, anchor. Um, no, I don't think there is a comet no. on there. Right, it's just the anchor. Oh yeah, the um, anchor. Yeah, it's the anchor. I meant the so anchor. it's VCP with the anchor. Oh, yeah. VCP. Yeah. It's a uh, and Le then Clicquot. there is the photo, the picture, the portrait of Madame Clicquot. Right, um, which I always think is. I mean, she doesn't. Yeah, it's late in her life. The lace cap is not a great look. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and the, it, it's the only picture, really. I mean, right? Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's, there's a couple, but they're all at that stage in her life. Um, oh, that's incredible. That's the most famous of them. I have to get back to my notes because it was on. Yeah. Um, sorry, because I had a. No. I keep, you know, I'm going back to the pornographic. Uh, yeah, I know. Like, hey, sorry, you just can't. <laughs> you're like, once you know that, like you can't unknow it, can you? <laughs> I can't. Like, so oh, I no. It's in the RAM now. <laughs> it's totally in the RAM. I got off my. Uh, that's so funny. So I want to. Yeah. Um, I hope we have time. Yeah. I really yeah. want to talk about. I'm good on time. So okay, whatever's really, on your end. I really want to talk about your, your vineyard and, and yeah, your winemaking. And. I know that I just I'm curious as to during this time of your um, exploring, adventuring, and learning, yeah. 
Like, how did that define or not define your winemaking skills? Yeah. Because I know that you do natural wines. Yeah. Um, and you have this vineyard, Parcells Vineyard, right. up in uh, British yeah. Columbia. British Columbia, yeah. So I so ultimately... Tell me, about, tell, me I, about, tell us about... When I was vineyard. writing this, I said that I got I, I went through a divorce. And, mm-hmm. and that was not something I write about in the book, you know, at certain oh. points. So I since fell in love and married a wonderful man, a Canadian man. And so we've, we're on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. But before that... Um, you know, for me, so I wrote this book and became very interested, you know, after talking with Ava and talking with um, Eileen and talking with lots of other women in the wine industry, really about, you know, especially this special connection between women and sparkling wine and the history of the wine industry. Um, and then after that, um, I was living still in Napa and Sonoma and um, had moved there pretty recently and um, wanted to keep learning more about wine. But if you've ever been to Napa and Sonoma, you know, you'll see those wonderful signs at the end of Dirt Road that says, you know, winery open. But scary. It's, it's scary, scary. isn't it? Because <laughs> right? like, it's yeah. so cool, right? It's like, and you're, but you're like, oh my God, I'm going to show up and I'll talk to a winemaker and they're going to think I'm stupid. <laughs> and Even right? as you're a conditioned wine yeah. drinker. Exactly. Even <laughs> as somebody who was a pretty experienced wine <laughs> yeah. drinker by then, let's get real, right? <laughs> Even then, I just, it was really intimidating. And I think that's what happens is that people go into Napa and Sonoma and you go to the big places because you're like, I can be anonymous yeah. there and I won't embarrass myself. It's true, right? right? And I thought, well... But that's like that's not what you really want. Like what we all want is to sit down in a beautiful mustard-filled meadow and talk to the real person yeah. who's making the wine and touch some of that tradition of yeah. like, you know, where does the story of the person who makes the wine, like Madame Clicquot, and the thing that you're, you know, the thing that you're going to drink and enjoy, like how do you how do you touch that real story? So. I um, I decided that I was going to write the wine guides for the people who were chicken like me. <laughs> and so I wrote a series of wine yeah. books called the Back Lane Wineries of Napa mm-hmm. and then the Back Lane Wineries of Sonoma. And there's now a Back Lane Wineries of New, New York. York. And uh, the idea was So they're called that Back Lane. Yeah, Back, Back Lane, Lane Wineries. Right, yeah. exactly. And they're a little, um, not little, but they're, they're books and Lots books of pictures. And pictures and... Yeah, I like to joke about them. Is the, the Jay Peterman of wine guides? <laughs> like, if you remember the old Jay <laughs> yes, Peterman catalog, totally. you know, and it was like the poet shirt. And when you have the poet shirt, what you'll feel is, so I thought, well, you have to really, you know, you have to tell the story because you can go and you can learn about how many points it got and you yeah. can learn about how much residual. I mean, the winemaker will tell you all of that, right? But what I think we all want is like, what's the What's the story of the experience of this place so that... And like the vines and the vit, yeah. like the earth, the soil, the, like the, the winemaking style or that person's personality because it probably goes into the sip. Exactly. That's how I... How I think that's yeah, exactly yeah. it. So, you know, for me, it was like there were 70 or 80 wineries in each of those books and each of them is a little story like the Widow Clicquot, right? Yeah. Of like, okay, this is the person. Yeah. This is the story. This is the emotional core behind that story, right? So I did that. And then, you know, what that meant is, and I I didn't see myself as a wine critic, right? I mean, I saw myself as a wine writer. So if I didn't like somebody's wine or if they were a jerk, (laughs) I just said nothing, right? Right. You know, your mother's, you know, (laughs) I mean, you know, know, if you have nothing nice to say, say nothing. Nothing, right. So, um, and you know, I didn't, you know, people weren't jerks. They were amazing. And, um, but what I did is I decided I didn't want to put winemakers in competition. Everybody has a story. If you go and visit, you'll make your own decision about whether you like it or not. I mean, I included only good wine, but, you know, you might, I like like a wine and you not like it and it's still a good wine. Right. You talk a little bit about that, how it's... Right? Like, I think that's really important. It is. It doesn't mean it's bad. People say, oh, is it good? Well, my flavor, I maybe don't like it, but you may because it's still good. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, there is such a thing as bad wine, you know, obviously. There's wine with faults and flaws. Mm -hmm. And then there's this whole broad spectrum of good wine... And some people like their wine with a lot of residual sugar, and some people really only like brute champagne, right? right? And so it's different tastes. So that was the idea of those. And in the process of it, I mean, I became amazingly connected in this wonderful community of winemakers in Napa and Sonoma, right? Because mm-hmm. when I went out, I spent two, three, four hours with people saying, you know, like, tell me your life story. Like, tell me how this is part of your dream. Like, what's, how did you get here? So made these wonderful friendships yeah, in Napa so and Sonoma. And um, and 
in part, that fueled my own interest, right, in being part of that wine community. So um, ultimately, I went and I did go back and do the winemaking certificate program yeah, at UC, UC Davis. Davis. Yeah. Um, Congratulations. Yes, that's thank not, you. That wasn't a, oh my gosh, I right? I fought for the bees in organic chemistry. Oh my I'm gosh. Like, oh my God. I hadn't taken organic chemistry <laughs> since I was, I don't know, 20-something. <laughs> it was hard. Yeah, that's... And it was in, I had a fabulous experience at UC Davis in that program as well. Um, but one of the things that UC Davis really teaches you, because that's its focus, is how to make a, a commercial wine, right? How to how to make a, a very, um, a, I mean, an a interventional, yeah. Like, but not boutique or what do you mean? Like how? Well, like, I mean, what it taught you how to do was, um, you know, it teaches you how to use enzymes in order to change the outcome of the expression, right? Okay. So it's, I mean, it's no criticism of Davis. Right. It's just that they're teaching you this whole set of tools, some of which are highly interventionist, yes. right? About the ways in which we can take fruit and we can manipulate it in order to create certain kinds of effects, right? right? And especially effects of consistency. Mm -hmm. Because many of us, what we want when we're drinking a wine is we want to know that if we drink Vauflico today, it will taste like the Vauflico tomorrow. Right. And of course, nature doesn't give you the same thing every time. Yes. So, um, you know, learned a lot about how to do that. And then in the midst of doing that, I also started learning about raw and natural wine. Yeah. And I ended up deciding that my heart was really in the the purest, the crazy purest form. Right. La Lalu, what was that? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So right? in the, yes. And so Isabel Legeron. Yeah, and, so you're in the, because well, you're in the champagne, which is a whole different, uh, you know, manipulation in a sense, what you have to do in order for the, maintain the integrity exactly. so that it doesn't blow up right. while you're trans exactly. transport. And then you go to UC Davis. Right. And, and you learn all about that. Right, then, all the ways that you can control the wine. Yeah. And then, you know, so my husband and I, then we decided that I would start a winery. His hus um, his family Why had been- start a winery? But, oh, well, it was, it really, it started, it was as silly as that, right? You know, we were, we were out looking for a house <laughs> and um, we came across a house that had a vineyard in it that was about a 10-year-old vineyard. And in, so did this you is in, did you this, to, I did. I emigrated yeah. to Canada. Yeah. And so lived there for about six years now, five, six years. And four years ago, we were just looking for a house and we came across this. And I was homesick, right? Yeah. Because, Napa. you know, Canada, Napa yeah. and, and, you know, living in another, it's like very, being an immigrant, even when the countries appear close, you're still yeah. a stranger in a strange land, yeah. right? And. I had insisted to my husband that we had to buy a house where I could see America from the window. So I kind of narrowed the pool of homes. I remember my husband saying, he's like, if you're, you're in luck, most of, almost all of Canada lives within 10 miles of the border. So that's really your only hope, right? Yeah. We have to charge your phone. Okay. 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 That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> You know what I, this is so funny. I love this because... Hyatt. <laughs> this is the Hyatt at... I'm just going to do it because you can't. Let's see. This is at John Wayne Airport, the Hyatt. He just told us we have to have our corkage fee. We're cool with that. That weird Hyatt. <laughs> and You're going to get in trouble too, but it's all my no, fault. It's a, but the, the funny thing is, is like the, a yeah. funny thing about the, yeah. the, mm. the champagne, like yeah. the, huh? it's congruent with... The whole mystery of champagne and trouble and trying to beat it. I mean, it's just funny, right? I mean, right. It's just, it's just, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that was funny. He was, he is our Jean Remy Moet. I think we can just say. Moet just came over. Moet just saying, came wait, 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 wait. I'm like, Jean Remy, it's too late. We've already captured Russia. <laughs> it's like, I love it. That's what are you so going to do with that? I know. Random. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the story was that we, you know, we ended up coming across this house which had these palm trees. And you wouldn't think, but you know, in Victoria, um, Vancouver Island is... Like palm is a, trees? Yeah, it's like oh, a Mediterranean climate. That's so crazy. So, um, you know, Napa is a 9A in the USD zoning, you know? Yeah. And it's an 8B. So it's, we're wow. about two weeks behind Napa and yeah. Sonoma. So it's really a lot like the Sonoma Coast in yeah, that sense. The Palm trees, Mediterranean wow. summers. And so as a result, there is, um, uh, especially in the Cowichan um, and then in the area that we purchase land, there are five or six wineries. Wow. And it is the Wild West up there of winemaking. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's what Napa and Sonoma was in the 70s. Oh, it's so cool, right? right? So it's, it's an amazing it's, moment. It's so great. And like a wonderful community of people who are 
you know, trying to figure out what it might mean to make wine on this wow. island, which is cool climate wine. So we we just kind of on a lark bought it. And my husband's family had been in the Loganberry wine industry in the Loganberry 20s. Is like the blackberries, like sweet, was it sweet wine? Like, wh- yeah, you know, is like a, it's like a cross between, is it blackberry like and blackberry something and else? Like a raspberry or something. So yeah. it's a kind of like a... There's be- beverages that are loaded. Right. I mean, I don't think you want to make wine out yeah, of it. It's really <laughs> <laughs> But um, it goes back to the Luther Burbank, right? Up in Sonoma. Uh, yeah. um, he was yeah. the guy who who hybridized whatever yeah. Logan Berry ends up being. So my husband's family had been in the and Parcel Vineyard had been um, part of the Loganberry wine industry. So it was just kind of the serendipity uh-huh. where my father-in-law said, you know, hey, I've got all this old equipment, you know, like all the old Parcel wine, you know, the grape picking or the Loganberry right. picking buckets. And so we decided that we would restart a family business that had existed in the 20s uh-huh. and then Prohibition shut down. Wow. And um, that way we could joke that we'd been, we were fourth generation <laughs> winemakers, but we had just skipped two generations. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> of course. I love that. I'm a fourth like, generation You are a fourth generation. Yes. Yeah, so we, we just skipped a couple. We just skipped a couple of generations. Mm-hmm. So, and then what we decided was that we wanted to start a, um, a natural, raw Raw natural wine, and when you when you say that, what is what do you mean a little bit by that? Like what, so people can understand what yeah that means. So um, so what it means is so it starts in the vineyard. I mean, we really believe very seriously that um, wine is made in the vineyard, and it starts with um, we're we're ridiculously into what's known as regenerative farming. Mm-hmm. So what that means is we don't use any pesticides, any synthetic herbicides, any synthetic fungicides, or any synthetic fertilizers. So um, you know, about synthetic fertilizers, you could still be organic, right? right? You could get organic synthetic fertilizers, but there's a reason that you can make bombs out of fertilizer, <laughs> and that's because they're a byproduct historically of the munitions industry. Uh-huh. I mean, really, that starts after the Second World War when they've got all of these bomb materials, and they realize that it's TNT and it's full of nitrogen, and oh, if you put it shoot. on the soil, yeah, you can gonna... fertilize. Wow. But the problem is that they're inorganic salts. And so mm-hmm. they end up, they kill the microbial microbiome. life, the yeah. microbiome. So regenerative farming is really all about honoring the microbiome. Yeah. And there's this wonderful research coming out of places like Davis right uh-huh. now that what we've historically thought of as terroir in the wine industry is actually a function of the microbiome and the plant's ability to mm-hmm. uptake nutrients right. that are expressive of microbiome. So it's wow. not really the dirt the soil, yeah. it's the things that are alive in the soil. Oh, man. So it's kind it of like starts our gut, there. right? The microbiome. Exactly. It's just like that, <laughs> right? Like the, yeah. And if you've got healthy gut flora, then the organism is healthy. Yeah. And, you know, if the soil is the gut flora of the plant and the plant produces the grapes, you get this great quality fruit. So, um, so it starts there. And then what we've found, and we do use, you know, biodynamic Principles, principles as well like with the moon and yeah, yeah and, and you know and especially compost, compost teas, teas is the yeah. big thing um so um so that's how we fertilize we have sheep that live in the vineyard nice. and some geese oh, and nice. some lots of chickens oh, nice. and then we do compost teas um uh, that we do, we, do the, with the my husband does the yes two preparation yeah. and the, well he makes his own because we're crazy right the camel on the thing with the very yeah the nettle yeah no i mean the moment he said i need you to go plant some nettle. I'm like, okay. okay. I, and it's a full moon. Like, I mean, I, I, yeah. I plant according to the biodynamic calendar because yeah. I think it truly makes sense with the pull and the apogee and the perigee and the, of the it's moon. So and it's so interesting. And the signs. And so I, I'm a Yeah, full, so you're totally. I'm so come totally up and visit. Into, where yeah, you're I, totally I in, the, in the crazy regenerative I, zone too. <laughs> and what's interesting to us is that, you know, when we bought the land four years ago, the vineyard had not been farmed that way. It had been farmed just conventionally. Yeah. And what they say is true is that the first three years are a rough ride in transition. I mean, there's a reason that it's three years oh, transition to organic yeah. or biodynamic. Because in the first two or three years, things got a lot worse. And oh. everybody was saying, you can't do it that way. You're crazy. And we really struggled. And this was our fourth year. And my husband's sprays in the vineyard for powdery mildew, which yep. is the big risk for us, are sulfur, baking soda, neem oil, Castile soap. And like plant compost, like, you know, like yeah. seaweed and kelp. And that's it. I mean, there's nothing so that you could... spray couldn't... it. He sprays it. he doesn't want to be wearing a suit out there. I mean, if you, if you exactly. have to wear a suit when you're spraying, there's something not right. Completely. Because you're going to be eating that. Because you're going to eat it. 
right? I mean, the studies that come out of Napa and Sonoma, Sonoma has gone all sustainable, right? Because when they did a test, even organic wine in Sonoma was showing up res- residue of Roundup. Because of the... Yeah, it's the just, it gets in the groundwater. Gets, yeah, and, everything. you know, and I know that Monsanto says that it's perfectly fine for you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> personally. Like, uh, yeah. I don't want to risk it. Personally, my it. policy is yours, right? Yeah. Which is if you got to put a Tyvek suit on, you don't want to be drinking it. No. So our policy is no Tyvek suits. Wow. If you can't breathe it, if you can't touch it, then you don't yeah. want to put it in your body, right? right? Because there's microbes in your body and, you know, yeah. that's, they're it's, like our second brain, right? right. So It is our second it's brain. It's our second brain. <laughs> So, um, and then we just carry that. So raw and natural winemaking begins there. You can't make raw and natural winemaking unless you do wow, that regenerative yeah. farming. I mean, it has to begin there with at least a biodynamic practice. And then we carry it over into the winery with, it's just a zero, it's a, it's a zero manipulation. So we do make a sparkling wine and uh, about half of our production is sparkling wine. <laughs> and we use no sulfites in the winemaking process. Not because, I mean, sulfites are preservative and they're a regulated substance because at a high level, they're toxic, right? right? So that's the reason they're regulated. Right. But for us, the key thing is that what sulfites do is they kill the enzymes and the yeast. I mean, it's like the kill, it, it kills it's what's kills, in the wine. That's right. its purpose. And I'm like, well, but you know, yeasts have aromatic volatiles in them and enzymes contribute to the flavor. I mean, autolysis in the, function, in the making of champagne is an enzymic reaction that makes champagne. So I don't want to go to all the effort of making a wine and then do things that just in order to preserve it, I'm killing the flavors that I'm trying to create in the wine. So we don't use any sulfur in the winemaking process. We don't filter. We don't find... So when you don't filter, I'm fine. So in the reds, it might be at the bottom... Well, or we, the whites. You only make whites. Whites. We make no, whites you, and red. Reds. You make we do the a red. The, the yeah. one that you're, the I can't even pronounce yeah. it. The M. Mon- the Marichal Foch. Thank you. And we also make a Gamay Noir. Oh yeah. Um, we become really interested in making and doing carbonic maceration. Okay. As a way of handling northern climate fruits, which of course is what they do in Beaujolais yeah. when they have northern climate reds. So right. we're really interested in that. But I, I do bottle the wines clear. It's just that. It's, we've gone back effectively to tra- a big version of transvasage, <laughs> although we also riddle by hand. Oh, really? So if okay, you ever so, come up yeah, and you want to like I really, see, I really do. I really, yeah, I'm, do I'm come definitely going to come up. Because it's hysterical, yeah, right? You know, oh I'm gosh. like the, the joke. You're the winemaker. I'm the winemaker. Like, and he does the, the viticultural, viticultural part. Okay. Yes, because we found yeah, that everybody yeah. had to have his or her own domain and for marital bliss. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? But it's so funny if you come up and see the riddling, um, the champagne. Of course, you know, it can explode in the beginning stages. Yeah. And the truism in the champagne is you can always tell the champagne maker because I've got one eye. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So and I'm like, that's not how I'm losing an eye. So um, so what I do is um, I put my husband's hockey gear on. Oh I've got gosh. one of those. You can come and check it out. I put on one of those full masks, oh um, you know, like yeah, the full wraparound mask. And I have my leather gloves. I oh found like God. at a yard sale somewhere. These like these full on like super sexy leather gloves oh that come God. all the way to my elbows, and I put them on. And it looks like I look like something out of some really strange, you know, goth thing with my mask. And then I put my husband's hockey gear on oh to gosh. pad myself out, Just so that if case. it comes, I don't want it yeah. to like you know, yeah, it's strong. Like, it comes you know, out. comes and hits you yeah. in the throat. Like I'm not it's, dying that yeah, way. Like I'm living to drink more champagne <laughs> here. So I get my, I'm like the Michelin woman <laughs> doing the like riddling. riddling. <laughs> I might be a little bit overkill, but nobody's going to get hurt in my yeah, winery. I love it. Um, oh God, so yeah, it. so we um, we do it that way. And I am able to bottle it clear because mm. we just are really patient about the racking and oh, let it settle off yeah. and let it rack out. Rack out. Um, so, it. so it falls. I mean, yeah. eventually, you know, eventually all the sediment will fall to the bottom and you just have to be really patient. Um, and for us, you know, you have to make a decision. Are you going to let the wine ever have oxygen yeah. in the beginning, hyperoxidize, or you have to spend the entire winemaking process putting sulfur in, potassium metabisulfite, to prevent it ever having, con- you know, having an you, exchange. So does, it, does, a lot, does anything have to do with transporting the wine or sending, like if you're going to, if you were going to sell it, like export, I don't know, to me. Yeah. Would you have to change... So, well, the other thing we do is that, so we, um, so I can, I, um, it's not heat stable. So raw okay. natural wine is not heat stable. Okay. So it's not that I, I mean, I, you know, we're right now in the stages of opening up, um, getting a Washington state business license okay. so that folks would come up and visit. 
don't want to carry stuff across the border. Right. I'm just going to have a little um, warehouse over on the San Juan Islands and like just, FedEx it to you for yeah. 25 bucks. I can do that, right? There's not a problem with that unless it gets hot. Right. And the thing is, heat will ruin your wine regardless. regardless yeah. And you just won't know it. But with raw and natural wine, if it gets hot because it's still alive, you're also going to have, you're going to know it because it's going to start to re-ferment right. in the bottle. So the mm. real thing is that um, the reason that sulfites are put in wine is so that they can be transported and that they're heat stable. Oh, okay. Even though no wine is heat stable. Right. Wine, heat is bad for all wine, but you wouldn't know it as a consumer. Right. That's interesting. Right. Yes. So that's, for me, that's the interesting thing. So it is more delicate in that way. People always ask, you know, if I open it, does it go off faster? No. It's like, it's, it's, you know, the organic chemical reaction is exactly the same, right? That, you know, an alcohol exposed to oxygen converts to an aldehyde and then it converts to acetic acid. Like, it's just, if you leave your wine on the counter long enough, <laughs> right. it will open up aldehydes and yeah. aromatics and then it will turn to vinegar. Like, right. it's you know, it's just how it is. That's just what happens. That yeah. will happen to any wine. So it doesn't have to do with shelf life right. because a natural wine could age indefinitely as well but it's the heat stability issue. And so the other thing that we do that means that we don't tend to distribute, like we're never, because we're interested in the carbon footprint part. So the other problem is that in the um, wine industry, the biggest waste is in the bottles. Like you buy it and you use it once. And then, you know, mostly- It's like a single use plastic almost. It's a single use plastic. I mean, it's not plastic, plastic, but it's- but it's single Similar, use. Yeah. Yeah. So really mostly what happens is they get crushed and then they get sent back to France or Italy or China. And then, you know, you're talking about the glass being shipped, shipped. back and forth each time. Yeah. It's- and so what we did is that we were the first winery in BC to get licensed to do growlers. Oh, like the growlers for the, like the beer yeah. that you can refill? Yep, exactly. Are you going to go old school like at France or Italy where you just, I, I know I was in Italy, yeah, I would we go have, to farmers and I would just, uh, exactly. to the farmers and yep. they had wine in the back and we would just fill, refill our totally. bottles. Totally. So we can do that. So what we did is we went one liter bottles and we did like the, we, we did them in dark. So the yeah. light, you know, yeah. stable, but, and then we have the flip top bottles. Oh, cool. And like then the we Grosch, crown cap them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Although they're, they look just like a, like a wine bottle. Yeah. So they don't oh, look cool. like beer bottles. Yeah. Cool. And then we just screen print them with our logo. Nice. And then um, charge a deposit on the bottle. Right. And then you bring me back the clean bottle, then I never have to charge you the deposit again. Wow. So we're really in that yeah, sense that's focused great. on a local market because we feel really strongly that mm-hmm. this single use, the single use idea is not sustainable. And I feel like in your their area that you're in, it's it's sustainable and it's logical for people and willing to, it's also community. Like, oh, I'm going to go, I got to be like, here's the bottle. Like it's a return. It's kind of a reason to go back to the vineyard. You might get some more wine. It just exactly. seems like it's a community thing. Exactly. And we do the local farmer's together. markets yes, and people can bring great. it back and swap it out at a farmer's market. That's great. So it is, it does. It means that, yeah, that the idea is that the place we put in this great picnic ground and, you know, the idea is that it becomes a place that people can come and hang out yeah. and, you know, yeah. and are you, you there can, often? I have to look yeah. to see the address again. And I know it's it, it's it's in, We're in um, Sanichton. Yeah, yeah, Sanichton. Yeah, Double A. Double A. Yeah, because it's an uh, Indian word. Yeah, Sanichton. Yeah, Sanichton, British Columbia. So we're in the um, we're just north of downtown. We're about ten miles north of downtown Victoria. So it's not that hard to get to. No, not at all. And um, uh, yeah, no, the you know those those wine tours that go up there, those buses. But the favorite thing is we're right on the bus on the bike path. Oh, cool! So you can actually rent the bikes, or if you don't like to, it's flat. But there's the motorized electric bikes. <laughs> right. So we have lots of folks who come out from you know the Empress. They get off. They come off over from Seattle on the Coho, and they'll rent the little electric bikes. And I'm like, guys, it is flat, but okay. <laughs> and they come out, and it's like an hour on a bike trail oh, right nice. to us. So it's great. Oh, you don't so ever have to. Hit a highway. So there is some co- coming back to well, you're. I'm excited to come visit, and I want to try definitely your wines. do. And That'd be fun. I when I think about we're talking about this wine tourism, Van Vove, and I'm like, and you have a bike path that parcels. I mean, there's some congruency of I don't know this whole story, and you gathering this yeah. information, contributions of Madame Vove, and then now you have this vineyard and. You know, you're kind of on a bike path, which yeah. is like, on a bike path, which is right. similar to kind of like to, the railway to, track. Exactly. In a sense, right? Yeah. And, and there's this community that's building that you're not even sure what yet. Right. Exactly. That's coming. No, and you're I mean, committed that's to this exactly natural right. wines. Right. I think that's exactly right. You know, that, I mean, I do think that, you know, I mean, I don't, you know, you don't always reflect on that, but, you know, that book changed my life in really good ways, right? Yeah. I mean, 
And I'm, you know, it took me a while, but I ultimately did take the girlfriend's advice, right? (laughs) Don't wait to do the thing that you really want to do because, you know, the minute you begin to do it, like doors start opening in places that you didn't know there were doors. So yeah, I mean, that, that was a story that changed my life in ways that I never, I never could have expected. If you had, could ask Madame Vov like a question or two, do you know what you would ask her after all this? Yeah, you know, the thing that I, I mean, there were so few letters, right? You know, there's that one letter from her at the end where she says to her granddaughter late in her life, you know, you need to act with audacity and you need to, you know, you need to seize the the vision of tomorrow, right? And what I, I think what I would want to ask her is, because what I never was able, I mean, that's part of the reason the cover has her kind of hidden behind the bottle. Like, you know... Uh, you never really, I never felt like it was possible to get to the emotional core of her story, right? Of, you know, it was clearly a love story in lots of ways, right? A thwarted love story in different moments. And what I would want to ask her, I think, is, you know, what was it like in those darkest moments, right? You know, yeah. what what did you think to yourself in the moments where you thought you're going to fail at this, right? And not that you're going to succeed at this, right? right. I thought that was... That was the thing I would want to know. Right. Sorry. <laughs> like, oh, like, and we were talking about audacity just now. <laughs> audacity. I know it's just like... So the darkest moments. We're in LA. I'm like, it's blowing my mind well, that this is happening in LA. Oh, in the county. Okay. All right. So that's the difference. See, I don't have a sense of that. Like, we're in county, But I wonder if we were in Hollywood, like yeah, nobody when there's a the, camera the, running would like, come the, up and be like... <laughs> <laughs> Got to give you a lecture, right? I know, oh, or twice. I know, a little odd, but okay. But sorry, yeah. that because that was an important mo- yeah. moment that you just was saying. <laughs> <It's> just. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got a drink to that. Okay, drink to that too. Oh, I no, you don't I've, have I any. Need just a little bit here. <laughs> Seeing how, yes, we've been. <laughs> I'm just, it's like too funny. It is too funny. <laughs> All right. Um, Here's to losing our train of thought and finding know, it again. Right? Finding yes. it, yes. Okay, yes. Cheers. So, yeah, cheers. Yeah, no. So the, the serious point about it was that I'm sure that there had to have been significant moments of self-doubt. You know, I'd like to know how she navigated some of that darkness as yeah. well. I mean, it's such a... You know, I mean, champagne is a drink of celebration and she helped turn it into that. Yeah, but and luxury. It was also, you know, a wine born out of a war and, you know, born out of loss and, you know, all of those, all of those other parts of that story. Yeah. And I don't think they in any way diminish the idea of, you know, the, the celebration aspects of, of champagne. I just right. think it makes the story more complex and it reminds yeah. us that, you know, life is full of all of those losses and all those risks. And we all think we're going to fail at things sometimes. And, you know, champagne's what gets us through the night, right? <laughs> no, no, it was so great. Well put. Yeah. This has been so awesome. I would, mm. I will, I'm going to come visit you and I'm, I Please want, do. I really want it. That'd be it. awesome. Be so fun. We'll do it again. Yes, we'll have, we'll totally have take it. two. Yes. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> will come up and ask us, I promise, <laughs> at Parcells. Darling, a cockage fee. Like, what? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, fine. Tell us later. Um, so I always like to end on, on a recipe. So Dr. T.R., can you um, share a recipe with us? Yes. So um, we're talking about recipes, food recipes or recipes, yeah, recipe for, for, life? for life? recipe for life, recipe on success, recipe, yeah. quote, recipe. Well, I love the, um, I love the, the, the Widow Clicquot's, you know, idea that, you know, you must act with audacity. I think um, in terms of recipes for life, that's one. But also to cycle back to what we were talking about, about champagne, you know, being, being this, this, beverage with a complicated story that can encapsulate comp- complicated feelings. I love, is it, I think it's Napoleon, yeah, right? Part, Napoleon's yeah. quote that, um, you know, in victory, we deserve champagne, but that in defeat, we need it. <laughs> so <laughs> cheers to that. Cheers to, that. to, to always good. having champagne, whether it is victory or defeat. Every day. <laughs> That's the recipe. Cheers. Every day. Mm-hmm. Cheers. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. T.R. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. you. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed listening to that episode. And again, please rate and review if you did like this podcast episode or any of the other ones. Please go to iTunes, download, rate, review. I appreciate that very much. Just Forking Around Podcast. And again, I am Debbie Salzberg. My handle on Instagram is at Forking Podcast. My website is just forkingaround.net. And I am so excited to have you on board here with me on the Just Forking Around podcast. And I look forward to seeing you on the next show. 